Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 110. I'm Steve Kwan. Just me today. Brother Matt's not here, but I do have a very special guest, Professor Bruce Hoyer. Bruce, how are you doing? Not too bad. Yourself? Doing pretty good. Can't complain. It's a new year, you know, (laughs) got all my resolutions underway, so I'm hoping for a good one this year. I had you in mind for an episode for a while. You were brought to my attention because of the particular way that you structure your classes, Bruce. My understanding is that you've been pioneering a reverse classroom model for jujitsu. Am I phrasing it correctly there? I suppose. I don't know. Like uh, pioneering seems like it's, I'm I'm doing way too much, but I'll... A couple of years ago, maybe five or six years ago, I kept teaching classes and I was just like, man, this doesn't feel like the the best way because we've had, you know, different classes where it was beginners and intermediate and advanced. And it just seemed like some guys were, were bored with the content that we were showing or, you know, some guys felt like it was just way over the top. And so it started kind of learning uh, as much as I could. And I saw like a flipped classroom style and it, it really appealed to me because it's like, okay, this, we can kind of go through, you know, this curriculum at, at a different pace until everybody feels like they understand it and then keep moving on from there. So that's kind of the appeal. Got it. Got it. So forgive my ignorance here, but what is a reverse classroom? Like how would you actually explain this model? Sure. So instead of me going in and, and coaching like you, you normally would, I think the probably the biggest one is, you know, people coach, you know, something for either a week or a month and the instructor sits in the middle of the class and says, okay, this is what we're doing. Everything that we do is pre-taped online. You know, it's over the the years that we've had the the gym now. We've had it for 12 years. And so we have a library of of videos, as I think a lot of people are starting to do. The students watch those beforehand. And uh, usually it's based upon a couple different things, how, you know, how new they are, obviously, and then what their end goal is. When everybody starts, it's just basic jujitsu. And then after that, they've kind of, you know, started to get their feet wet at like blue belt. And then that starts to switch off to, okay, now we're doing more stuff for MMA, or we're doing more stuff for gi, more stuff for no gi, or just strictly self-defense. And so everybody's kind of going through a different curriculum. So everybody's working on different things every single, you know, day. So you might be doing, you know, say a a basic scissor sweep from close guard, and the person next to you might be doing a, you know, a barambolo or kiss the dragon from, you know, reverse daily or something like that. So it's kind of crazy that way, but That's kind of the basic idea. And once that person feels comfortable with that and I feel comfortable with them doing it, then we kind of move on to the next thing. Got it. So it sounds to me, if I understand correctly, that what you're describing is kind of like student-directed model, which I guess is where the name comes from, reverse classroom. Am I understanding correctly? Correct. Yep. And so for me, it's like reverse classroom or flipped classroom is just the idea that we want that student to take the you know, the amount of time that it takes them to get through that and not feel like, okay, we need to push this through. And if they get it, great. If they don't, I want to make sure that everybody feels comfortable with as they kind of go through that material, they're going through it at their own pace and that they feel comfortable with it. Yeah. Yeah. The challenge I've had with traditional BJJ class structure is that I felt like it's just not really based on anything. It's not really based on any evidence that that style is the best. And what I'm talking about is kind of the three-part class structure that I think we're probably all familiar with, where you go to a class and there's some degree of warm-up. In some situations, it may not even be a warm-up that actually has anything to do with jujitsu at all. Then part two is technique of the week, where there's something that the instructor has decided is what we're going to cover today, and the instructor shows it, and then everyone parrots it. And then the third part is some degree of rolling session. And most gyms around the world that I've seen have kind of settled on that structure. And I'm not really aware of any evidence that that is actually an optimal way to learn. I mean, we've had guests on the podcast before who have presented a degree of educational background that kind of leads me to believe that that structure actually is not optimal for teaching. And as someone who has been on both sides of the coin as a student and as a teacher using that structure, I've never really enjoyed it. I felt that there are sometimes months that go by where I just don't really get anything out of class because what is being taught doesn't speak to me or I feel like we're not given ample time to learn a technique properly or the right circumstances or in some cases I feel like I'm just not getting it and I'm not given enough time to get it right I mean if you're a white belt and you show up and there's some 
tremendously complicated sweeping technique that's shown that's out of context. You're going to be struggling to absorb all of the steps and probably won't be given enough time to do it. And so I'm definitely interested in this, this self-directed model that you've got going on here. Now, what led you to to adopt this model? What was kind of the point where you realized that this was the direction that you wanted to go? Because I'm assuming that like the rest of us, you probably came from the more traditional three-part class structure and then had an epiphany one day that that was not the way to do it. Yeah, a little bit. Like the the weird part for me is, you know, growing up in South Dakota, which is, you know, not a very densely populated area. I'm guessing it's probably a similar situation with you guys up there as, as well at times anyways, or as far as jujitsu, but we didn't have a lot of jujitsu here. And so my coach, yeah, he, he showed that stuff, but he was a purple belt at the time. And I would travel so much that I felt like my learning was really kind of a hodgepodge of Mm -hmm. everybody. I was very fortunate in the fact that like I had a, a decent job in the baking industry and I was working four days a week, a Monday through Thursday. So I would travel Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And so, you know, I would go you know, one week I'd go to Leo Vieira's and, and train there for a couple of days and then go and train with uh, Comprito in Chicago for a couple of days. And, and so it was weird that you, while I still had my home base where I was, I was training from, and that was that style. I felt like a lot of my learning came just kind of hodgepodge from mm-hmm. all these different instructors. And so that was really interesting for me too, where I, I felt like it was slightly different in the fact that I didn't have, you know, one, one path to go down. Got it. Got it. So how did you go about starting on this? Because one of the things you mentioned earlier was that you've put together over the years a database of techniques and videos that your students can watch. And basically, it sounds like they do their homework first. They come up with a game plan for themselves. Then they come into class and you help them troubleshoot and refine it. But to get that off the ground is probably quite a bit of effort, right? Because you've got to have some degree of techniques first in order for students to be able to self-direct. So out of curiosity, how did you get this thing started? So the the first year that we started, that I started thinking about it, most of it was me just reading books on, you know, learning styles and, and just different different ways of, of coaching. And we started filming pretty much from right then. And, you know, I kind of knew that we were going to end up using them in some way, uh, shape or form. Originally, it was just going to be as kind of a beginner program. And then we just started filming everything until the point where we have a couple thousand videos on there and started creating it that way. But the first year was really just me filming stuff and trying to figure out the best way to do it. And I, we're probably on our, you know, fourth or fifth iteration now. So. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so when you got started at the beginning, did you supplement with other instructors content? Like, did you basically say, Hey, you know, well, we don't have the full database yet, but you can bring in anything from anywhere. Or did you encourage students to stick to kind of your curriculum out, out of the gate? Oh, for sure. You know, I have a lot of the content out there for them, but I'm, I love the fact that we're in a day and age now where you can get extremely good content from, from YouTube, from producers out there of DVDs and things like that. So I, I push a lot of the the students, you know, I say, Hey, this is not my game. This is a system that so-and-so has developed. Let's have you watch some of this stuff as well. And I think that's, you know, there's definitely the stuff that I like to see, but I, I realize that I'm not good in all aspects of jiu-jitsu i think it's vastly becoming very niche worlds where mm-hmm. you know slowly it's going to diverge in between two sports just like you see in wrestling uh with freestyle and folk style or excuse me uh in greco yeah there's just so many variants in jiu-jitsu right even right. going beyond just gi and no gi once you start getting into specific rule sets and man even beyond that just particular funnels that people create right my brother for example specializes in the modern leg lock game and i don't do any of that i do a a much more traditional pressure-based game so it's totally possible for an instructor to specialize in just one area and to actually not be particularly strong in others it's kind of reminds me about how in judo you know you have your your takui waza your favorite technique and so you might be really awesome at a few particular throws but generally not be so great at like the other 60 plus throws that are available to you yeah even now you'll still see me try to supplement a lot of that with other instructors in there just because I feel like it's so important. And like you said, I definitely don't want to send an athlete out to a competition without them at least having a base knowledge in some of the niche stuff that, you know, people are starting to develop. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And this actually raises an interesting question that, you know, I, th- I think every instructor has some degree of confidence concern when it comes to this, right? Because in a traditional classroom model, the instructor gets to dictate 
the class content, right? If I right. want to do butterfly guard, then it's going to be butterfly guard today. And that's just the way that it's going to be. But if you are letting students choose the curriculum, then very quickly, those holes in the instructor's knowledge are going to get exposed, right? I mean, right. I have the ability in a traditional classroom to steer the direction of the class. And that means I can steer it into areas of my knowledge. But if the student is choosing the curriculum, it is possible and, and actually probably likely that they will start taking on areas of study that are well outside of my depth. Now, personally, I would see that as a good thing, but I can see that also making it hard for instructors. And I'd love to know your thoughts on that. You know, how do you deal with students who want to pursue areas of study that are well outside of your area of expertise? Right. A lot of times we're looking for additional resources for that. I think I'm in the same boat with most jujitsu guys that started. I started in 1999 or 2000, you know, so for the longest time, I mean, it was pretty, I don't want to say bare bones, but like very fundamental jujitsu. And then with all those guys now developing it, it got, you know, more complex and more complex and more complex. And so when somebody comes in that, that says, Hey, I want to work this, this other system, I, I get pretty excited about it. And you're definitely right. I mean, there's with the leg lock stuff five or six years ago, I was getting viciously exposed because I just wasn't mm -hmm. very comfortable with it. And I think that a lot of instructors were that way. Like I said, for me, it was, I was excited about it because like, okay, this is a whole new area of jujitsu that I get to, to try out. And that it's, it's fun for me. I get now students that give me a, a new challenge because of that deficit that I had. So, and it's, I think we're always going to find new deficits every couple of years. So if not, then I guess you're Hicks and Gracie or something. I don't know. So. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm very wary of instructors who don't have deficits, right? I know that for a lot of us, we don't want to expose our weaknesses and we want people to think we know everything, but the reality is nobody knows everything. Even within a relatively narrow field of study like jujitsu, no one knows everything. I don't care how good you are and how much you train. And I think that it's a problem that a lot of instructors feel this pressure to walk onto the mat and be the oracle of knowledge where you know every single thing and you have an answer to every single question. And I think in my opinion, at least one of the signs of a good black belt, and I would say one of the main characteristics I look for in a good black belt is that they're humble about the limitations of their knowledge. They know they don't know everything. And rather than trying to pull an answer out of the hat whenever someone asks them a question, they will admit to the limitations of their knowledge and try to coach the person towards the right answer and maybe help bring in other resources if need be. Yeah, for sure. I definitely always try to give my opinion as far as like, you know, in the, the realm of like a basic concept, here's what I'm doing, but then I like pushing it to other people. Like we have, you know, another number of people that, you know, enjoy kind of the leg systems and I really like Lachlan and Giles stuff. Some of the, the wrestling guys, we, for some reason, we just have an absurd amount of wrestlers here. So I really like the, the style that Gary Tonin, you know, that fast action style. I like pushing people to, uh, to watch some of his material. And I think that also gets them excited about combining the two sports. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I understand the, the kind of need to feel like you have an answer to everything, but it's so liberating and freeing when you kind of let go of that. And it actually is empowering for your students too, right? Because you can have a student who, you know, maybe they're only a, could even be a blue belt, but if they've got one particular area that they're passionate at and they study a lot, they can actually find a home in your gym as kind of the resident domain expert and share that knowledge with other people. And now as the head coach, you're no longer the bottleneck for all of that knowledge. You can kind of train up the other people in the room to be teachers as well as students, which is good. I mean, of course, you have to have some degree of quality control and that's where the instructor comes in to make sure that, you know, what's being taught is good technique. But still, I think it's good to kind of give some of that control to students so that they can also be coaches in and of their own right. Yeah, for sure. I think that makes them, you know, forces them to learn a little bit faster. But I mean, if they're not kind of double checking, okay, why, why am I doing it this way? Then it makes it way more difficult to teach. I feel like. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Got it. So in terms of the logistics of a class that operates in the reverse classroom model, how does that actually work? Like, do you find that there's an optimal size for the class? Is there a certain student teacher ratio that needs to exist? I'm just kind of wondering like how that materializes on the ground. Sure. So the first weird thing is that pretty much everybody has their phone with them on, uh, on the mats when they're drilling. So it's, it's kind of odd that way. We have a lot of people that will come in and 
they'll kind of wonder like what in the world is going on. <laughs> um, so I, we, we developed an app that essentially has, you know, the curriculum that they're going through. And then after they've kind of been through most of that curriculum, it has all the, you know, basic positions and then advanced positions. Once that person gets through all the curriculum, then usually they're working on a, a particular position for a while until they feel confident in that. And then we're moving on from there. And so you'll see that person, you know, usually sit for 10 or 15 minutes before class and look through those videos. And to save a little bit of time, we have the videos and then we created a little GIF or GIF, um, depending on who you're, who you are. <laughs> yeah. Because it's, I like saying GIF, but anyways, <laughs> we'll have a, just a little clip of exactly what I want out of that. So that's kind of nice to use as a reference. Once they get on the mats, they can say, okay, yep, this is, is what we're doing from here. And they can kind of explore so usually we'll do that for, you know, 15 or, or 20 minutes, and then I want them going live from that position. So say somebody's doing close guard from bottom and top for a little while, see kind of where that stuff breaks, things that they're trying. Usually whenever, you know, they're, they're drilling a technique, they'll actually try it out on somebody else. So then they don't get to see, that person doesn't get to see what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like that's definitely a, a little bit more realistic. I'm like, okay, I'm going to try to get my timing right on this technique rather than, okay, I just drilled the same exact thing with this person. And then now everybody's going to completely lock up and not let me actually do it. And then the other person, uh, would find somebody to do, you know, a reverse daily Heva with say, and so they would work on that, uh, going live for like usually 10 minutes from that position. Then they're going to come back and drill again. So say everything went wonderfully, then we're going to go ahead and move on, find uh, some additional details in there. If it completely broke down, usually they're talking to me and saying, okay, this this happened, you know, what am I missing here? And so it's more of a collaborative effort. Basically, we, we drill it, then we try it live, and then we drill it, we try it live, and we just go back and forth, and we'll do that uh, usually three times in a practice, and then it's just live rounds after that. So not really an optimal, like, size. I feel comfortable, um, you know, we'll have you know, sometimes classes of 15 or 20, but a lot of times we're having classes of over 30 people. And I feel like that is still applicable because most of the time I'm just making minor adjustments, walking around, making a minor adjustment. And it, it makes things a lot easier because there's not that 15 or 20 minutes of me instructing where they, you know, that's additional time that they get to, you know, either try a try drilling something else or trying it live as well because I feel like that's the the critical part is I want to see where it breaks and then that's usually going to show you the the error that you're making so yeah what's interesting is it kind of sounds like you're encouraging almost like a laboratory type environment where people are you know they're not just sitting there parroting the technique of the week but they're doing mini experiments they're testing them out in different situations they are coordinating and collaborating with the head instructor and their training partners and just trying to find the right answer Whereas yep. I would say that the traditional class structure is very much more top down where, you know, professor comes in and says, we do this and that's what we do. Yeah, for sure. And I really like that side of it. For me, it, it really opened it up. Like it's, it seems really weird. I would say I lose a little bit of like the entertainment value of being a coach where it's like, you know, I, I make fun of person A jokingly and everybody laughs. And then we, you know, I make fun of myself and everybody laughs. And so we lose a little bit of that with this style, but I think it's, it's definitely more catered towards to learning and, and, and really honing in on your skills. Yeah. 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 Huh. I guess a question I have for you is when you got 30 people in the class, I mean, even if you have everyone on the same curriculum, that can be a handful just to pay yeah. attention to everyone and make sure they've got their hands and their feet in the right place. And I can only imagine it gets more complicated if everyone is doing an independent curriculum. Do you struggle with that, just with the cognitive load of having to juggle the fact that everyone's trying to do something different? I'm just wondering if you've got any advice on how to deal with that, where, you know, student A is practicing X guard and student B is practicing double A takedowns. Is it hard to context switch from person to person and accommodate everyone individually? I definitely think it was in, in the beginning. Now it's just completely what I'm used to. And uh, we have another black belt here. We came up at the same time. So his name is Lee. He's, uh, he's been doing it, you know, 20 years now. And, and he's, you know, competent with that same system. It's all he's known for a long time now. And so uh, he helps out a lot of, with that. And then the nice part is that usually within iShot, we usually try to go in little pods of people. And so, you know, maybe four or six per, per group. And there, each one of those should have 
somebody that's been, you know, that's a purple or a brown belt, um, they can help you out with, you know, details. If they're seeing something, you know, they work on it um, with you real quick if I'm not able to get over there. But yeah, initially it was an extra workload for me, but now it's it's almost a little bit nicer because you, as a, as a coach, it's like, okay, I'm eating from a buffet of, of things compared to like saying, you know, to everybody, 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 okay, keep your, you know, keep your right foot here on the hip, you know, because everybody's making that same mistake. I like being able to say, okay, that person, keep your right foot on the hip. Okay. This person over here, I need you to step a little bit more off this takedown. I kind of enjoy that side of things. I can see that. I kind of find it kind of robotic when you're teaching everyone the same thing and you go to one person and you give them a little bit of a tip and then you go to someone else and you've probably tell them basically the same thing and you start to feel like a robot after doing that for a while but on the other hand I mean I can imagine it can be tricky out of the gate to move to this model because you kind of have to give up the expectation that you can really prepare for class as an instructor when I come in to teach I kind of have an idea in my head of what I want to do I sort of mentally rehearse I prepare it and so I kind of have an idea of what the structure is going to look like but I can imagine that when you go into a reverse classroom you have no idea what's going to happen on a daily basis which is probably a bit chaotic and I would assume both terrifying and liberating at the same time as the instructor yeah, for sure. Now it's, like I said, it's easier for me. But yeah, in the beginning, it was it was definitely a little bit difficult. So yeah, yeah. Well, I would like to maybe dig into something that you mentioned earlier, you talked about how your gym, you know, it's normal to see people like going through their notes and pulling out their phones, and presumably based on the whole structure of what you're doing, talking amongst themselves. And I mean, at a lot of jujitsu gyms, this would be anathema, right? Like they have rules like you must not talk while the instructor is talking and you cannot do a different technique from what the instructor shows. And it's a big no, no. And I mean, I know gyms where man, if someone pulled out a phone on the mat, they'd be kicked out. And I personally think that all of that traditionalism is very dogmatic and not conducive to learning. And I'm just wondering, do you ever get like a culture shock where people come into your gyms and they're thinking, man, this is not like the traditional master student relationship I thought I was going to get on a martial arts. Yeah, for sure. It, you know, more so when we have somebody that uh, especially, well, really any level of, of jujitsu person that's maybe they're coming into town because of relatives or, or for work or whatever. We've had, you know, a bunch of black belts, uh, brown belts and that have come in that are just like, this is, this seems completely odd. And it, the nice thing is, is that I haven't really had anybody that once they've been through it have been like, ah, you know, I didn't, I thought that was, you know, terrible. I didn't really enjoy that. Everybody seemed to like really understand kind of the process once they've been through it, you know, for a couple of classes or if they came in for one class, it was it's usually kind of refreshing where like, if, you know, you come into a class, I'm going to usually flip you a phone and say, okay, here's my understanding of, you know, reverse daily HIVA. Run through this whole thing, you know, look at it a little bit. If there's anything that you have issues with or anything that you don't understand, come see me, but I just want you kind of going through that almost like it's a, you know, DVD series on a, on a website and working through that live. And so most people have definitely enjoyed that, but it's definitely odd when they, when they first look at it, they're like, man, this, this isn't going to work. Or they think that it's some garage gym that they're mm -hmm. just like, oh, this guy doesn't know anything. He's just showing stuff from YouTube. So, yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I think people come into martial arts with these weird preconceived notions that they probably get out of Hollywood, honestly, where, you know, they look at the instructor as the master who sits on the mountain and dispenses knowledge. <laughs> and I think it probably takes people off guard when they're expected to take ownership of their own development path. But I also think that's very important because something that I've noticed is most jujitsu instructors they aren't trained educators. You know, they might be great competitors and they create a gym because they decide they got to monetize this whole thing somehow, but they're not trained educators. So often they just do what worked for them or what they were used to. And what winds up happening is basically rather than taking a deliberate practice to teaching, they're sort of copying and pasting their own knowledge and trying to create cookie cutters of themselves. I mean, I trained under an instructor for a long time who was a spider guard, you know, like collar and sleeve guard type specialist. And I hate that stuff. And for a long time, I really struggled because I just couldn't make it work. And then when I started training under someone who was more into like kind of like lazy wrestling, that whole game plan really resonated with me. And I started making huge gains just because 
I was no longer being cookie cuttered into a mold that I didn't fit into. And that's something that I think is really interesting about your approach is like, I feel I lost years of development because I was under instructors who tried to clone themselves into me and that just didn't work. And I like the fact that this model that you've got really gives people some degree of freedom of expression and ownership of their own development path. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, you're obviously going to work a lot harder at something that you, you enjoy rather than something that you're kind of getting thrown. It's like, if you were, you know, if you're, if your dad said that you were going to be a carpenter for the rest of your life and you were forced to be a carpenter compared to, you know, being allowed to pretty much, you know, enjoy whatever you like, the students definitely are, are more excited about that, I think, and being able to go down that path. I still think motivation is always going to be a problem. As I think students with jujitsu, they get, you know, motivated because they're doing really well and then all of a sudden their game gets shut down for a little while just because you know some little small error and and they're riding on some sort of plateau for a while and then things go up and so I definitely still have I mean all that same stuff but it, it's nice that like I said people can can really hone in on their own things that they really want to work on with my kind of just sitting on the sidelines saying yeah that's good or no that's terrible so mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. do you find that new people are challenging because they don't want to ask questions and kind of put themselves on the spot. This is something that I see a lot with even just the traditional model where white belts, they just, they don't know what they're supposed to know and they don't really want to disrupt the flow of the class. And so they kind of just sit there silently, even if they don't, you know, they might have a hundred questions and questions they should be asking, but they're not quite comfortable asking them. And I wonder, do you find when you're using this model that it takes some work to get like brand new people out of their shell to the point where they're willing to ask these things? I actually feel like it's, with this, it's the opposite where basically that's, you know, what I'm doing is I'll, if we have say 30 people in the class, I'm going to sit down with that group for two or three minutes and maybe drill a couple things with them, let them ask questions, things like that. And then I'm, I'm moving on to the next group. So me being able to sit down there and ask questions, watch them a couple of times and, and say, okay, fix this or fix that. I feel like maybe opens it up a little bit more for them to be able to ask those questions. Because I, I feel like our new folks are asking a ton of questions and usually actually fairly intelligent questions. So that, that makes me happy. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I think that part of it is establishing a degree of psychological safety and kind of just normalizing the whole situation where, yeah, it's totally okay to ask these questions. And I think too, once the white belts start seeing like the brown and the black belts asking questions, it sets this standard that it's okay for anyone to ask questions. Because, you know, if if a brown belt is totally comfortable speaking up and asking questions, then why wouldn't a white belt be, right? It normalizes that behavior from the top down. Yeah. And maybe this is terrible to say, but a lot of times when people first start, you know, I said, I don't really expect anything from you that's halfway intelligent in the world of jiu-jitsu for at least the first 60 classes. Mm -hmm. Just because the fact that, I mean, a lot of times, unless you've come back from or come from a wrestling background, people that are doing this stuff have no idea, you know, anything. And and a lot of times your your base movement from life is is the complete opposite of what you should be doing for jiu-jitsu. So that for me is a, you know, usually helps out it seems like if I, they say okay 60 classes that's and to them that seems like a lot and the next thing you know they have 60 classes and they're they're making halfway you know decent attempts at actually doing jiu-jitsu mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah it's i think that the interesting thing about what you're doing here is it kind of lends to a culture that is much more flat and kind of gets away from the hierarchy. And that's one of the things that I, I've kind of grown not to like about traditional instruction in jujitsu over the years is this master student relationship. I like the idea of kind of everyone being an equal peer at all of the gyms that I've seen where they've actually had a lot of success. Usually they have a much more flat approach versus having the instructor who knows everything. Yeah. And I think a lot of that came from, you know, I opened up the gym when I was a purple belt, our um, instructor, he was a brown belt at the time, and then he was uh, moving down to Phoenix, and so we were kind of left with the gym, and so initially I was going to buy the gym from him, and then we came into uh, some disagreements about the price, and so we ended up, I ended up just opening up another gym, and so luckily uh, him and I are still still friends and everything. I'm glad that that didn't, you know, destroy a friendship, but we, uh, once we opened up the gym, I was a, a purple belt and I didn't feel like I was, uh, you know, a super high level purple belt. I won worlds that year in no gi, but I by far didn't feel like I was probably the smartest, uh, purple belt. So I think that had probably a lot to do with it as we had so many people that were coming up with us at the same time. Um, Shana was in the, the UFC and then 
Ben was as well. And so I still felt like it was all of us were just kind of working towards our own separate goals compared to, okay, I'm the instructor and I'm showing everybody. So Awesome. So I guess I would like to know, is this a model that you've had any success kind of spreading to other gyms? Is it something where other gyms in the area have seen what you're doing and they've been interested in adopting it for themselves? It sounds to me like the kind of thing that, man, if I went to your gym and I saw this in action and I saw the results, I'd probably want to steal the model myself. So I'm wondering if kind of you were like the tipping point. You know, we started to see one in, uh, in Georgia that has started to do that same model. And then I think there's a gentleman in Australia that's also started to do that same model. But no, I haven't seen it really resonate with a bunch. We have a, a brown belt that runs a gym about an hour away, and he teaches it the traditional way. And so I think that has to be something that, I mean, I feel like there's a lot of really good things, but it also has a lot of flaws in the fact that just like any any teaching system. So I think each coach kind of has to really hone in on, on what way they want to teach and, and feel if, you know, if they feel it's the best, then that's what they're they're offering. But we haven't had a lot of people adopt this system really. That actually surprises me. I mean, I look around at some of the the gyms that are kind of more prominent in terms of their conceptual approach, and they have structures that sound quite similar to what you're describing. So I'm actually kind of surprised that this hasn't caught on more. I guess my question here would be, how did you first get introduced to this concept? And are there any resources that you would share if, say, someone is listening to this and they think, man, I want to steal this reverse classroom thing? Is there some sort of info package or book or website that you would recommend so that people can kind of learn how to get ramped up? Make It Stick was one that I really liked. Um, It's by Peter Brown. That was a book that I really liked just on basic learning systems and and things like that. And then there was a bunch of materials out there for uh, flipped classrooms, but really the that Make It Stick was a, a huge one for me. Um, I really enjoyed that book. It was a pretty easy read. And then just kind of researching those. There was a wide receiving coach or wide receiver coach that was doing the same thing as well with his with his athletes as well. And so uh, I looked at a lot of his stuff and he was, you know, seemed positive about it. So we went forward with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a fantastic book, actually. I, I love that book. You know, I read it not to do with anything related to jujitsu, but I read it as a business book. And I love just the idea of how it gives you very specific, actionable things to retain knowledge. That's a problem that I think everyone in jujitsu can relate to is just there's such an overwhelming bombardment of details and knowledge that most of it does not stick. (laughs) And really, I think most people would agree that anything we can do to make those ideas stick better would be very desirable. Yeah, for sure. And that's, you know, one of the, the things that we run into and that we're trying to work on now is it seems like we get so much information that there needs to be times when, where we found anyways, that there needs to maybe be times where everybody's going through the same thing. And so right now we're actually going through at the gym just a couple of weeks where um, we're working on, like this week we were doing guard passing, starting from a either completely open guard situation or, you know, somebody sitting on their butt and then just going through. And I said, okay, here's these uh, 10 or 12 concepts that I want you guys to think about. But for the most part, we're just passing. And I've really enjoyed that as well, just because I feel like it consolidates a little bit of that information that people have been digesting for the, you know, the last couple of weeks or months through the curriculum. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Cool, man. Well, I would actually want to know, because you mentioned earlier that jujitsu isn't the only thing you do, but that you have a career outside of the art. I'd love to know this reverse classroom model when it comes to training other people on a job, when it comes to building a team, do you find that you can use the same techniques there? Do you have to adapt them in any way? I definitely feel like you, you know, right now, this is my, was my full-time job. I, for the longest time I worked in, uh, like I said, banking for the computer security side of things, but I definitely think that it's uh, adaptable for just about everything. I see that slowly switching to a lot of schools kind of using that same mentality. And to me, it makes a lot of sense just because if that, you know, if that student, I really like not to send a, you know, a student out that's going to be doing, you know, some sort of high level job, be it, you know, security or computer security or, you know, plumbing or whatever that doesn't fully understand that. And it'd be nice if they could say, okay, you're going to get this uh, degree, uh, you know, as fast or as slow as you need to, but you're going to have to get close to a hundred percent on each one of these, you know, these tests. And so you can take as long as you need to go through that stuff. Uh, but we need you to make sure that you're completely competent in that, not just, you know, 70% competent or 60% competent, because that's, I feel like where a lot of things break down. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I think that you've 
put brought up something interesting here, which is that there's often tremendous time pressure on people to learn things in a certain period of time. And I think that's one of the issues with the way that we teach, right? When we are training people under the traditional jujitsu model, where there's like a technique of the week, by default, you're time boxing people. You're saying you've got a week to learn this. And that's not really fair or effective for everyone because everyone learns differently. Everyone might be at different parts in their game in terms of development. And just because you don't learn something as fast as someone else, that doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. I mean, so much of it is context. Like as an example, if you were to show me a new sweep from single leg X guard, I'd probably pick it up right away without even drilling it because I'm a single leg X player. I've got a lot of those movements ingrained. But if you were to ask me some spider guard thing, I mean, there's going to be white belts and blue belts who can pick it up faster than me. And I think that sometimes people get really discouraged because they are given these time boxes with which to learn things like, uh, you know, this is the technique of the week. So you got to learn it within one week. So I think what winds up happening is probably like the majority of stuff that we teach students is just in one year out the other, because we never go through those processes to make it stick. Yeah, for sure. And that the, uh, the tough part of that with that same model is, you know, if, Okay, if you're showing stuff for the week and that person comes in, you know, once a week or twice a week, they're only getting a small percentage of what they could be, you know, if you're actually going through that full system like a student going five or six days a week would. I do enjoy the fact that we can, you know, they can take their time. If they're coming in twice a week, fine. It's going to take them a lot longer to be able to get through that that system, but that's fine. Just as long as they know kind of that system as a whole compared to, okay, I know these two things that were taught on, on a Monday and I know these two things that were taught on a Thursday. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, cool stuff. Well, I mean, I'm kind of inspired. I'm off the mats at the moment, but as soon as things are back on, I think I'm probably going to give this a go. We'd already kind of moved more towards a more casual learning environment where we kind of give more freedom to the students. But I think that the nice thing that you're doing here is you kind of have a structure to the lack of structure. And it's something that I'm personally eager to explore. I mean, I, I'm, in, I'm off the mats now. I've been off the mats during the pandemic. But when we get back on, this is probably going to be something I look into going forward. I do have one last question, just in terms of nomenclature here and, and language, like, is this the same as Montessori and those types of models? Forgive my ignorance here, but I, I hear these terms a lot. And as a the parent of a young child who's going to be having to go into a, you know, the school system pretty soon, is this like what Montessori is or is that something different? Yeah, that same kind of idea, you know, reverse classroom or flipped classroom. I've heard Montessori before. I've always taken like Montessori stuff is, is more like hands-on kinetic style, but I, I think that error comes with, with doing jujitsu as it is. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much, Bruce, for your time. Really, really appreciate it. If people want to learn more about you, um, where could they go to do that? Do you have um, a website, any info you want to share on your academy? Feel free to just do a plug here. Sure. NextEdgeAcademy.com would be our website. And then we are located in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So we're, we're fortunate in the fact that we get to have just some of the affiliations that we have with some of the hospitals and stuff here. We, it's nice because we get a lot of people that, that travel here, everybody from, you know, brand new folks to, to high level guys. So it's, it works out that it's, it's a really weird place. So come and train and I want to have everybody come and try it, see what they think and uh, give me your opinion, you know, good or bad, just because I, I really do want to make the best system possible um, for the students. And so definitely come in, give it a shot. Let me know what you think. Got it. Got it. Awesome. And you mentioned that you got your techniques online. Is that something that's only available to your students or is that something that other people remotely could check out? It's only available uh, to my students, but you know, if people said, Hey, you know, I really want to check out your system and it's a, uh, you know, coach or something like that, by all means, they, uh, hit me up and I'd be happy to share some of that information. It's, it's one that I, I do want to push a lot of student, you know, people to do, because I think in the, the, with the pandemic happening, a lot of instructors have, have filmed so much stuff. And so now they probably have a big library and maybe they're thinking of, you know, how can I make this a better resource? Uh, so I'd love to help out with that as well. It's something that I'm eager to see take off. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I'm guessing that in the pandemic land, kind of this reverse classroom style, probably actually, is suited for something like that, right? Because you no longer have this model where everyone must, you know, sit under the tree of knowledge that is their instructor. If people are already conditioned to do their own learning 
online by reviewing your content and coming to the class prepared, then it's just a matter of finding a way to give them feedback remotely, which is probably a lot easier if you want to teach remotely than the kind of like traditional model that we normally use in most gyms. Yeah, the the nice part with that is that, you know, when we were completely shut down, you know, we had, you know, I'd be watching on Zoom with 20 or 30 people. And again, tw you know, 20 or 30 people are doing different things. And if they, you know, raise their hand and then I'm linking into that, the nice part is that we had almost, you know, or a large portion of our, our students were either, you know, living with somebody that also did jiu-jitsu or were roommates or, you know, their spouse. So it was really nice in that fact that they already had somebody that they could kind of hunker down and, and still train with. So. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Well, to all of our listeners, as always, the best way to support us, if you would like to, and I, we would greatly appreciate it if you would do so, is to go to patreon.com slash BJJ Mental Models. It's the patrons who keep the lights on here for us. We definitely make it worth your while with access to things like our community discord and premium content. Again, please do consider it patreon.com slash BJJ Mental Models. Bruce, thank you again so much for the chat. Really appreciated this. I'm looking forward to giving this model a try when I get back onto the mats. Awesome. Hey, thank you very much for having me on. No problem. Take care, man. Bye.